It's a real pleasure for me to introduce John Snyder. John has been a patron of the library for years now, and we're honored to think we've helped a little bit with his two books, Hill of Beans, Coming of Age in the Last Days of the Old South, and Crossing Ethiopia. Some of you may have heard him read from Hill of Beans at one of our Live from the Library evenings, and if so, you know you're in for a treat tonight. Before writing his books, John retired as an executive director of Morgan Stanley. He holds seven patents, won first place in the New York Film Festival for an industrial film, and wrote two off-Broadway plays. Such a well-rounded person is best suited to provide a portrait of complex times in Africa, and I'm pleased to note that Crossing Ethiopia has received a very positive response from the Ethiopian community in the United States. Please join me in welcoming John Snyder. adventure described in Crossing Ethiopia came about when I read Alan Moorhead's The Blue Nile back in the 1960s. It was published in 1962. And I was intrigued by Tawodros the man and by Ethiopia the country. <clears throat> this is Tawodros from the official account of the expedition that the English War Department published. In a nutshell, Tawodros was a self-made king who rose by sheer genius, military and otherwise, from obscure bandit leader to the emperor of Ethiopia. And he immediately perceived what England had and Ethiopia lacked. And he wrote Victoria, seeking closer relations. And insulted by her failure to respond, or the uh, parliament, whoever received the letter, he imprisoned the British consul and ultimately <laughs> most of the other Europeans in Ethiopia. Uh, thereby drawing in a huge army of almost 64,000 to spring 67 white Europeans. <clears throat> and he had, he had all of the men lying in chains atop Magdala, which was the royal prison and treasury, a truly remote place in the middle of Ethiopia, 400 miles from the Red Sea, and itself 9,100 feet above sea level. All of this takes place in the mysterious fabled highlands of Ethiopia, source of the Blue Nile, and it's an incredibly mountainous place from 7,000 to 15,000 feet above sea, le sea level, and it had never been, it was never conquered by outsiders. Um, the drama approached its conclusion as, <clears throat> as Britain's large invading army and King Tawodros' much smaller force converged on Magdala, his prison, in 1868. <clears throat> this map shows the respective lines of march of the, of the two armies. The, the British landed up here on Annesley Bay and marched due south 400 miles to Magdala. It took them four months to get there. The, they started with the 64,000 men and eventually an army of 5,000 crossed the Bashila River for the Battle of Magdala. Meanwhile, King Tawodros, this was his capital, Deborah Tabor, and he marched with his army on this route to Magdala and got there two weeks before the British Army did, and it was this expedition that I made from Deborah Tabor. I followed his line of march, which is across the country that was basically roadless in 1972. <coughs> Just to give you an idea of the kind of terrain that these two armies had to cross, this is a contemporary etching showing the British at Dongolo on their march south. This is about 200 miles along their way along the 400 miles. And this is the kind of terrain that they crossed for the entire trip. It's an incredibly rugged place. And meanwhile, to Odris, it's approaching from his capital Deborah Tabor, and he had, had his lay missionaries make this enormous seven-ton uh, mortar for him, and he had run, he had run out of, of horses and mules by that time, and he dragged it to Magdala with 500 men. And this is 
and he dragged it down into the <coughs> Jetta Ravine and then up on the on the other side and it was uh, it was a, a trip that took him it took him 41 days to make this crossing of, of the Jetta. The British crossed it in his, on the road that he had made in one long day. It was 18 miles across it. In any case, I decided back in, in that, late 1970, in the early 70s, that I would that this would make a great movie and that I was the one to make it. <laughs> so what qualified me to write such an ambitious film? Well, basically nothing. I was 38 years old and I was working for a small carpet mill where I wrote brochures and ads, and, but I did do the company's still photography. And my only movie experience came about one day when my boss called me in and said, John, our distributors don't believe we really have a mill. He said, I want you to go down south and make a mill film so we can prove it to him. So he, he gave me a budget of $10,000 and I made a 20 minute 16 millimeter film called Revolution Underfoot, of course, for the carpet business. And it won first place in the industrial category of the New York Film Festival. And following that triumph, I enrolled in Flora Schreiber's film writing course at the New School, hoping that might be a way to get me out of the carpet business. <laughs> I don't know if you know who Flora, if anybody remembers Flora, she wrote a, a best-selling book called Sybil, that a woman who had about 25 different personalities and was made into three movies, and uh, I think it, she did quite well with it. But she taught film writing at the New School, and she had a little contest for her students. The person who wrote the best script got to produce it in the New School Auditorium. And back in 1967, I won it, and Flora brought in a real film critic who, after viewing one of my plays was called The Transcontinental Redemption of Bus Proceed Done, which was about a man who had cornered the kerosene market. Uh, after, after watching this masterpiece, she, he allowed that I had a pretty good ear for dialogue, and he said, since you aren't married, why don't you move out to Hollywood and give it a shot? So, well, I soon got married to Joanne Kennedy, who is here tonight, a girl who wanted to live a normal life and raise a family, so I stayed on at the carpet company and didn't go to Hollywood, but my determination to go to Ethiopia remained strong, and I went about uh, set about making plans to go. This table would come apart. <clears throat> well, the problem was how in the world would I get to that part of Ethiopia, and how would you follow painful overseas march from Deborah Tabor to McDowell? And I started by calling the consulate here in New York and Ethiopian Airlines. Petra Solomon, the acting consul, who is also here tonight, he, he asked me to write him a letter explaining my motives for the trip. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to Solomon Mardesha. Everybody's got Solomon at one end of their name. Uh, manager of Ethiopian Airlines, and he said, this seems so complicated, I should drop out of the office and talk it over. Uh, and when I got there, he said it's simple to get to Lalibela, Axum, Gonda, and Addis, but as for McDonald, nobody ever goes there, and he couldn't be of any help. So he tempered this disappointing news by inviting Joanna and me to a cocktail party, and there, who did I run into but Petros Solomon, to, to whom I had just sent the letter explaining my motives, <laughs> and other New York members of the Ethiopian community who befriended us because of my interest in Suodras, who was a great hero in Ethiopia. Um, from those days, I'm sorry. <clears throat> from those days, this is a photograph, and that's Petra Solomon on the left at one of the many parties that he and Solomon invited us to. Uh, <clears throat> but I, having been told that no, nobody ever goes where you want to go, I still had the problem of trying to find a way to make this expedition. Uh, fortunately, I had read a book on, on uh, to work with by Sven Rubinson, a historian at, at, in, who taught at the Pali Selassie One University in Addis, and he was retiring to Sweden, but he said that he had a colleague, Dr. Donald Crummy, a fellow historian who was also an expert on to Ogres, and he referred me to Dr. Crummy. 
and Dr. Cromie turned out to be deeply interested in, in going on to March with and said that he had a student in Deborah Tabor, uh, Shumit Shoshin, who is here tonight also, who could join us in Deborah Tabor as our translator. So Dr. Cromie himself would obtain permissions to transit the provinces we had to cross. We had to, we had to go about 454 kilometers from Gondor to, the, to Magdala. Um, so the problem of getting there where nobody goes was solved, and we, we, we set it up to meet Dr. Cromie in Gondor, the ancient capital, on December 31st, 1971. Um, not knowing exactly what we were getting into, we packed tents, sleeping bags, freeze-dried food, and my big Mamiaflex C33, <laughs> trusty two and a quarter by two and a quarter camera with Phelps, and headed out. <clears throat> well, on the flight from Athens to Asmara, Asmara, which is in Eritrea today, it was, Eritrea was part of Ethiopia in 1971. That was our first stop. We had to be sitting next to a retired police chief from Milan, and we told him what we were, where we were going, and he said, he said, you'll need at least two armed guards, and he illustrated the consequences with a cut throat and rolling eyeball routine. <laughs> and anyway, we landed there in the middle of the night, and that gave us something to think about. <laughs> uh, the in the daytime turned out to be a beautiful little city, 7,600 feet above sea level, with delightfully cool air. It was quite unthreatening, and I began taking pictures in here. This is partly a picture show, so uh, here's some pictures of, uh, this is Esmera in the background behind these two brothers. These are four boys who reluctantly posed for me. <laughs> and here's a man who did likewise. Um, go back now to the, <clears throat> this is a, a close up of the northern part of the, of the where the British landed. I wanted to go down to, from Asmara to Masawa on the Red Sea coast. You see Masawa on the upper right, and uh, uh, Asmara was not on the map at this time. It's just to the east of Masawa on the top of the highlands. Uh, I wanted to see where the British had landed with their 44 elephants, and they actually built a 20-mile railroad to the foot of the escarpment to move their, their supplies to the mountains themselves. There's a incredibly hot desert down there. And you could get down to Masawa by descending 7600 on the highway that begins right here in the lower right hand corner. That's considered one of the most twisting roads on earth. Or you could go on a short hop. Um, Ethiopian Airlines at the time had a huge fleet of DC-3s, so we, t we took the DC-3 um, uh, alternative, and this is Joanne about the board. Um, and this is the runway at Masal, the gravel runway. And we, we emerged from the plane into a furnace-like desert uh, atmosphere and were faced by a squad of, of soldiers with automatic rifles who were extremely tense and searched us thoroughly because at that time the guerrillas of the Eritrean Liber Liberation Front were very active and about to uh, move further on up toward Asmara. So it was, it was a little scary. After a night in the Red Sea Hotel, we returned to the airstrip, and the soldiers seemed even more agitated than the day before. One of them uh, insisted on opening about a half a dozen rolls of my 120 film with his bayonet because he apparently thought they were little sticks of dynamite. Anyway, they finally let us on, on board the DC-3, and as, as we lifted off and, and climbed back up, to the, to the crest of the, of the massive escarpment. This for centuries shielded Ethiopia from the outside world. And it reminded me of how in 1843, two young Englishmen returning by ship from India looked up at this same prodigious mountain wall and on the spur of the moment decided to go ashore and plunge into the heart of Ethiopia. They were Walter Plowden, then 23 years old, and John Bell, both of whom would play a vital role in focusing Emperor Tewodras' attention on the West. Plowden was deeply impressed by Tewodras' ability and potential, and he eventually became the first British consul in Ethiopia. 
John Bell, a military office, officer, joined the Emperor's Army. He went native. He started wearing Ethiopian garb, and he never went back. Uh, he became a close and trusted lieutenant. And it was Bell who introduced Tawodras to Shakespeare, which he called Bell's Bottle. I think this gives you an idea of the dimensions of Theodore as a person. He had a, he was a remarkable man who, who appreciated uh, Shakespeare. Well, tragically, both of these men died in 1860 when Tawodras' plans to reform his feudal country were still possible. Uh, Plowden was murdered in the countryside and Bell was killed fighting beside Tawodras against the rebels who had killed Plowden. And they're both cited in Tawodras' famous letter to Victoria, uh, which went unanswered and from which I'll read a portion here. <clears throat> this is, he, everything Tawodras wrote was in very elegant language. And this one begins, In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, <clears throat> King of Kings, Theodorus of Ethiopia, to Her Majesty Victoria, Queen of England. My fathers, the emperors, having forgotten our Creator, he handed over their kingdom to the Gallows and the Turks. But God created me and lifted me out of the dust and restored this empire to my rule. Mr. Plowden and my late Grand Chamberlain, the Englishman, the Englishman Bell, used to tell me there's a great Christian queen who loves all Christians. I gave them my love, thinking I had found your majesty's good will. All men are subject to death, and my enemies, thinking to injure me, kill these, my friends. But by the power of God, I have exterminated these enemies, not leaving one alive, 1,500 of them. Although they were my own family that I made by the power of God get your friendship. I wish to have an answer to this letter by Consul Cameron, and that he may go with my embassy to England. Well, this is the letter. These are excerpts from the letter that went unanswered. Uh, in addition to showing how much Plowden and Bell meant to him, this letter also reflects his deep Christian faith. He, the Romans had been educated in a convent school, and he knew the Bible by heart. He could actually out argue all of the Orthodox priests on, on matters of on, on religious intricacies. Uh, and I think the story of Tawodras might have well ended quite differently than it did had these two men and his beloved first wife, Talvech, lived. All three were lost to him early in his reign, and without their settling influence, he, he was beset with constant rebellions, and his, all of his reforms were frustrated, and it brought out a darker side of his nature, and he gra gradually became a changed man. Now, to switch from that, as we went in to, as Joanna and I went into Ethiopia, we stopped by Axum and Wallabella, and these are really just tourist spots, but they're quite outstanding, so I thought you might like to see a couple of things. <coughs> uh, this is what the Axum Airport looked like in 1972, <laughs> the gravel strip. Uh, and this is what Axum is really famous for, the still life, which are all carved from single pieces of stone, and many of them, most of them date to the fourth century, and some of them are actually pre-Christian. Uh, from Axum, from Axum, we flew by DC-3 to Lollabella to see the 13th century rock-hewn churches, um, and I'll show you a few shots of them. This is St. George's, which is carved out of living rock, and it's not only carved out of the ground, but it's also fully finished and carved out on the inside, as are all of the churches in Wallabella. <clears throat> These are clergymen inside of Libano's church. And outside on a hillock, these, these boys all posed for me. You can see what a beautiful countryside it is in the background. <clears throat> this boy is wearing what's called a mateb around his neck, and that signifies that he's a Christian. From Lollabella, we flew by DC-3 to Gondo, the ancient capital, to wait the arrival of Dr. Crummy the next day. And as we had a drink in the courtyard of our hotel, a tall, deeply tanned American with a huge knapsack introduced himself. He said he was a, ty a, a tightrope walker from the circus, and he explored exotic places like Ethiopia in the off season. And on hearing our plans, he said, one doesn't hike in the Ethiopian countryside. The shifters, that's the Ethiopian word for bandits, will kill you for your boots. It's 
Two of my buddies tried it and were lucky to walk out in their underwear. Well, with this warning and having also heard from the police chief from Milan, we didn't sleep too well our first night in Gondor. <clears throat> but in the morning, Dr. Crummy arrived. Here he is. <laughs> <clears throat> from Addis. He flew in from Addis with this wide brim hat, which he never took off, and he had a little black suitcase strapped to his back. And when, when we recounted the tightrope walker's warning, he brandished his dulla, which is this ubiquitous Ethiopian walking stick, and said, nonsense. We have official permissions from Crown Prince Af Asper Wasson, Haile Selassie's son, we will not be harmed. You think I would take such a risk having a wife and small children? Well, that reassured us. And that night, under a full moon, we passed a church on our way home from dinner, and pointing to the graveyard, Dr. Crummy told us that this was the final resting place of Walter Plyman, the murdered British consul. <clears throat> I mentioned it again here because it was Plyman's replacement, Charles Cameron, the Tuogos Commission to deliver that letter to Queen Victoria in 1862. And rather than deliver it personally, Cameron had it forwarded to London from northern Egypt. And then he made the mistake of returning to the Emperor's camp without a reply. Well, this qualified him to become Tuogos' first uh, hostage. He was thrown in chains until a, until a reply was received. <coughs> The next day, we, we explored Gondor while Dr. Crummy made the final preparations for our trip. Now, <clears throat> Gondor's famous for its Portuguese-influenced castles. This, is, this one was built by the 17th century Ethiopian king Fasilates in the Portuguese style. And lions were tr traditionally housed in, in, uh, in a part of, of this castle, and they, they still had them for rent there when we went through in 1972. So here's Joanne posing with a small lion of Judah for a small fee. <laughs> <laughs> in the afternoon, we, we, we took a taxi 60 miles south, south to Lake Tana from which the Blue Nile, uh, it's the source of the Blue Nile that flows out of it. And on returning to Gondor, we learned that Dr. Crummy had called Debertate a single telephone and to check in with Schumann, our translator, and he was told that Schumann's father had died and he wouldn't be able to accompany us on the trip. So we had a little conference and, and Dr. Crummy decided we'd go on anyway despite his less than fluent Amharic. Uh, the next morning we took a bus south to Warrata. And from there, a Land Rover would take us east to Deborah Tabor, to Rogers' capital from which he had departed for McDowell on his last march. And Dr. Crummy told us to enjoy the pavement because it would be the last we would see for hundreds of kilometers. <laughs> um, here again is a map showing where we are and where we're going. We had just come down from Gondor on the upper left to the to a point on opposite on the uh, eastern bank of Lake Tana, opposite Deborah Tabor. We're going to take a Land Rover over to Deborah Tabor to pick up Schumann, if his father hadn't died. And then you'll see a place called Gafat up at the top. And this was what I would call towards the <coughs> Silicon Valley. And I'll explain that as we go along. Anyway, we arrived in Morata. And it was market day. Uh, this is a giant walker, a wild fig tree, which is in the center of the market. And these people are selling blocks of salt that are brought up from the Danakil Desert on the Red Sea. They were, for, for many, for centuries, they were a form of currency. Uh, and while taking these pictures, I was suddenly whacked in the back of the head with a clod of dirt. Uh, <laughs> I found that my big Mamiaflex, I had a red filter on it to take to make the clouds pop out, and apparently that uh, was taken as a source of the evil eye, and, and we made a hasty retreat from the market. Um, and after recovering from my punishment for propagating this evil eye, we boarded a Land Rover and about a dozen other uh, fellow travelers for the dash to Deborah Tabor, and it was a dash because. There were rumors of, of bandits in the area, 
And the formula for avoiding it was to go as fast as you could and never stopping. And as a last resort, the driver had a 45 caliber coat strapped around his neck. Anyway, we made it after a bone jarring three and a half hour ride. Uh, we came to Depo Tabor, and to our amazement, we were greeted by Schumann, whose father had not died as reported. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> We pitched our tents in the yard of Schumann and his fellow teachers uh, here, and here are Don and Joanne and Schumann the, ne the next morning. Uh, Schumann was doing his year of national service in Deborah Tabor before continuing to get his, his degree in, at Holly Selassie Warren University in, in Addis. Uh, <clears throat> now, since we're in Deborah Tabor, you probably would expect to see his castle, but there is none. Tarovers always lived in the royal tent, and in his heyday, it would be surrounded by the tents of, of his army, which would consist of 40 to 50,000 men. And if his army hadn't been reduced in size to around 5,000 at the time of the British invasion, this, this battle would probably have come out, the whole story would have come out quite differently. <clears throat> From Deborah Tabor, we, we hiked north for two hours to Gafat to see the remains of the houses and workshops that Tuogus built for the six lay missionaries and their families who worked for him there harmoniously for many years. He, he used them to make, to build roads and find, in, in the end to build armaments for him. Uh, and these workers were continuously referred to by the other missionaries in the country as the Gafat people, or the Gafat workers, they looked down on them. But Tarotus took very good care of them. He built them homes, and he, 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 he treated them quite well in, in return for their technical ability. That's why I call it the Silicon Valley of Tarotus. It's as close as he could get. He, he tried. <clears throat> now, I should hesitate a moment here to just to describe the European Protestant missionary situation in Ethiopia during Tordus' day. They, they came in three flavors. First, they were the conventional missionaries who were out to convert anyone they could. And second, there was a group from the London Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews. And they were zeroed in on the falasha of black, black Jews. And finally, there were the lay missionaries who taught trades and proselytized by example. Well, Tordus particularly disliked the first and second categories, and he forced them to baptize anybody they converted into the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, while he befriended the lay missionaries whose te technical skills he highly valued and whose preaching he, he ignored. <laughs> <coughs> I mention these missionaries here because each group contributed to his inventory of hostages. Six from the categories one and two were imprisoned early on, uh, and although the Gafat people, the lay missionaries, remained free until near the end, they and their families added up to 22 of the 67 hostages. And interestingly, 25 of these hostages turned out to be children, and 11 were women. And two of the women were daughters of John Bell, who had married, uh, who, who married two of the lay missionaries. I think it's also a good time to read uh, one of Tuodras' most perceptive quotes, <coughs> which bears on the colonial role of missionaries. And to quote, I know the tactics of European governments when they wish to acquire possession of Oriental states. They first send missionaries, then consuls to support the missionaries, and then armies to support the consuls. I am not a Roger of Hindustan to be humbugged in that fashion. I prefer at once having to do with the armies. And he was to follow his own advice. <clears throat> now, I'll go back to the narrative of our trip. And here I, I, I'm going to follow with a, a series of photographs taken between Deborah Tabor and, and Gafran of people in places that were truly little changed since the time of Tuogos. What I thought was particularly remarkable in 1972 was the pristine quality of the countryside. It was as yet unreached totally by Western packaging. There was no plastic, no paper, no cardboard, and other modern trash. Whatever was discarded 
return quickly to nature. So it made for a very beautiful countryside. <clears throat> this is a, a photograph of a horseman that we encountered, bet encountered between the flat and Deborah Tabor, which I used to, for the cover of the book. This is a clergyman in his shaman at a nearby church. <clears throat> a rice stubble uh, after harvesting. Uh, this is this is why I used a red filter on the camera. It makes these huge cumulus cumulus clouds pop beautifully. Now this I, I'll keep this map up for a little bit because we're going to we're leaving now from Deborah Tabor and we're starting starting east ultimately to McDowell. Uh, we had originally planned to travel from Denver Tabor to our next stop, Nefes Moocher by Mule, and, but, and Schumann had suggested that we obtain rifles to guard against shifters. But Dr. Crummy insisted that we rely on our permissions, saying the bandits would kill us for the rifles. Uh, <laughs> in any case, we didn't go on foot. The pistol packing Land Rover driver agreed to take us in, in his Land Rover, and, and we made it to our destination in a day. But it was a day of passing through incredibly beautiful rolling country, and uh, we did have a couple of breakneck We had two flat tires and one axle that gave us a problem, but they were all fixed. That's our first breakdown. Uh, these are tuples, the traditional Ethiopian house uh, silhouetted against the sky. And we passed just uh, north of Mount Guna, which is one of Ethiopia's highest mountains. It's 14,210 feet above sea level, and it was actually covered with a sprinkling of snow as we passed under it. Um, these are two handsome Ethiopian horses in a stubble field, and <clears throat> with a red filter, you get cloud shadows show up, pop out, as well as the clouds, and it, it made a nice moonscape of a picture. And this picture, I think, is probably the best one I took on the whole trip. It's a, just what I consider a truly biblical landscape, a man plowing a wooden plow and another crossing the countryside. <clears throat> In any case, we arrived at Nefes Moche, our next stop, which was the home of the, of the governor of Guyent province at about sundown in a mixture of sleet and rain. And as, as soon as we pitched our tents, we were invited to have dinner with the governor. And he turned out to be an incredible host. And this, our two nights in Nefes Mujer were the highlight of the trip. And here's some pictures of the governor and his uh, family and associates. This is, this is him with his sister. And that bulge under his sweater is his German Luger, which he had carried. And he had fought uh, Mussolini's army in the in the uh, Italian uh, occupation of 35 to 41. Um, and this is the governor with his secular staff. And this is uh, with the religious arm. This is the way uh, Ethiopia was traditionally divided up at that time. Uh, the governor would have, he'd have the people who ran the province and then and they respected the church. And it was all <coughs> equally powerful. Uh, and sorry. Oh, these are the these are his priests. And this is a picture of Schumann at 22 holding an automatic rifle. And this is before Schumann spent three years as a guerrilla fighting against the dictator Mengistu. And that experience moderated his fascination. His fascination with guns. He told me he never wants to see another one. Uh, <clears throat> this is a. These are these are these girls are the twins, and they were the daughters of the of the governor. Beautiful faces, and this is one of his associates. That's a classic Amharic profile with his shama gathered up around his neck. Um, <clears throat> I'll bring the map again now. We are we're. Nefes Mucha doesn't show on this map, but it's about halfway between Deborah Tabor and this Jetta River here, which in Ethiopian is called Jetta, Z-H-I-T-T-A. Um, 
He had, <clears throat> after the two nights in Nefes Mucha, the governor he helped us prepare for the next 90 kilometers of our trip, which would be, this time it would really be by mule and foot. And it would take us to the brink of the Jitter Ravine at, a, at the place called Bitor, which you can, it's called Bator on here, but that's, that was our goal in two days. Uh, the governor helped us engage the muleteers and gave us passes to cross the provinces that were under his control. And this next series of photographs are, of, were taken as, as we, on this stage of the trip. This is Schumann and the muleteers getting ready to get underway. Uh, that's me crossing the Wadla Plateau in the footsteps of Tawodras. We followed his exact course. Um, in the, in, in the course of the day, we came across dozens of these threshing floors where the grain is separated from the, from the chaff in the ancient manner of throwing it up and letting the wind blow away the chaff. And they look like small tornadoes across the countryside. It was quite a beautiful, beautiful sight. I don't know if it still exists. But, uh, this was our first night on this part of the expedition. We, uh, we always uh, camped on... on threshing floors. Here we are breaking camp at dawn for the next leg. The next night, we camped in the police compound of Bitar itself, a few miles from the brink of the Jitter Ravine. Uh, Dr. Crummy was suffering from uh, dysentery and Joanne was dreading the day ahead because we had to go, we had to cross the Jitter and get on to Wobotana. Our next stop, that was to be 40 kilometers and in order to, we had to get there in order to, to rendezvous with a, with a biologist who had a Land Rover who would meet us and take us on the last leg to make drop. So we had to do it. We had to make it. And uh, this, is, this is when, this is as Joanne begins her descent into the Jitter Ravine, the 3,500 feet down, crying all the way and saying, if I get out of this alive, never again. <laughs> this is her halfway down. And this is this is the ravine itself. Now, that's how it looks in the dry season. In in the sun, during the summer rains, this whole thing would be a roaring torrent and and wouldn't be crossable. And that's one reason that uh, emperors like Tewodas had trouble with rebellions because it, during the, when the provinces that were separated by rivers were separated by these floods. There were no bridges, so you couldn't get in to suppress them. And when he finally did, it, he, he did it with some rather cruel uh, methodology. Uh, this is just to remind you that Tewodras dragged this thing, this huge seven-ton mortar, down into this ravine and up the other side, and it, that's what took him 41 days. And the British came behind and covered it in, in one, falling. But they were carrying their heavy guns with elephants. They carried, they, they actually went all the way into McDonald with 44 elephants and came out with 42, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Um, well, on, as we came out of the Jitter, this is a beautiful village. It was just sitting on sort of a shelf of the, of the western, uh, the eastern bank of it. And finally, we emerged onto the Delanta Plateau about uh, in late afternoon, and we still had to walk north to Orbitana, which we and we arrived there at 10:30 at night, half dead. And we had covered, we had made our 40 kilometers. Um, so we pitched our tents and woke up in the morning to this scene, to see, finally to see where we had camped. Um, and as we cooked breakfast. A group of men descended from these boulders up, up at the top with a body lashed to a stretcher. And the man had been hanged while we slept. And we asked, Schumann asked why, and they said he killed. So he had been executed while we slept. Another little sober note. Uh, but anyway, we had made our, our rendezvous with Michael Bray. He was a biologist who had slept in his land rover. And, he was doing research on sand flies that carry leishmaniasis, which is a terrible parasitic disease. And he worked for the Welcome Parasitology Unit in Ethiopia. It was a one-man operation studying these flies, and he had charts all over his walls of where he had found them. He went out on a horse every day. Um, but anyway, in his Land Rover, we crossed the 
the Vichello Ravine, which is another 3,500 feet down and up again, <coughs> which we would have had to die on foot or on mules had we not made the rendezvous with him. He was going to wait for us that morning, and if we weren't there, he was going back. Uh, in late afternoon, we arrived on the Tanner Plateau that overlooks McDonald from the north, and the priest of Tanner Michael Church arranged for us to camp at the police compound and serve us a great dinner of, of Wadden and Jero. And from Tanner that night at sunset, we at last saw McDowell laid out before us. So that's the 9100 foot mesa with the royal prison. Now, we were coming in from the north. The British came around from the south and came up from the opposite end. Uh, uh, and the next morning, the priest <coughs> provided horses to take us up to the top of Magdala. And this is, this, is, this is where all those prisoners lived, some of them for up to four <coughs> years. Um, it's about a mile long and a half a mile wide with, with precipitous uh, uh, cliffs coming off on, uh, on two sides and barely accessible at either end by, by gates. Uh, now, <coughs> we're all Magdala, and I'm just going to describe how things quickly concluded back in 1868. Georges arrived there with his army of about 3,000 now, two weeks ahead of the British. And he watched them through his telescope as they descended to cross the Bishola River. And at that time, he was drinking heavily and was quite agitated. And nobody knew what he was going to do. He was quite dangerous, and especially the, the uh, hostages. Uh, on, on this map, you can see the relative positions of, of the pres where the prisoners were and where the two armies were. Um, this is Magdala up here. And that's, this is where the prisoners were. And then you go through a gate onto this plateau here, Solange. That's where Tuogris' army was. And the gate, there's about an 800 foot elevation there. And then this drops off 1,400 feet down to this place called the Oroji Plateau. And the British had crossed the Bashello down here and come up through here to the Oroji. And that was the setup for the battle. Um, the on, on Thursday night, April the 9th, 1868, in a drunken rage, Jerobus hurled some 200 of his own native prisoners over these cliffs. Uh, that's my picture from the north. And this is a contemporary etching from, from the official. This is from actually Stanley was on the expedition. He was 26 at the time. He wrote a book called Kumasi, Kumasi and Magdala. And this is from his book. Um, anyway, the Europeans on top heard these screams of Tarotus' dying prisoners and were certain that he was going to throw them over next. But for reasons known only, only to him, he didn't. He spared them and he fell to pray to God for forgiveness. The next day, the next day, on the next afternoon, it was Good Friday, April the 10th, 1868, he saw the British troops emerge on the Oroji Plateau, where that you see them lined up here below. His troops are up on the upper right, on the top, on a place called Fall, which you can see in the inset. And 1,400 feet above them, and he ordered his army to attack. And they fell upon the British by flowing down these slopes with, on their ponies, but they were armed with spears and muzzle loaders, and they were mowed down by the British mountain guns, rockets, and it was the first use in military history of the Snyder, not mine, um, <laughs> definitely, breech loading rifle with horrific results. The British could, a British soldier could get off eight shots a minute with a, with a breech loading rifle and with a muzzle loader. You know, you got one and that was it. And his men didn't expect to run into that. They, they had been instructed to rush in and fight hand to hand while the British were reloading, while the British never had to reload. So the results were horrific. Jerobus' army there were 700 killed and 1,500 severely wounded, and the British, two killed and 18 wounded. Mm -hmm. um, 
So <clears throat> Tawodrus realized that his, with his army virtually wiped out, he decided to, to send down uh, negotiators to talk to General Napier. And he made a deal, he thought he had made a deal where if he turned loose the hostages, they would uh, actually help him in his own country and that he would not be forced to surrender. Um, his, own, his own officers advised him to kill them all, which he didn't do. He, he sent them all down unharmed. So with the hostages safely in hand, Napier demanded to order his surrender and he refused. So the British, they, they, they marched up from Oroji towards Magdala itself. This is from a contemporary etching there on their way to that plateau just below uh, Magdala to set up. And on Monday, April the 12th, they attacked Magdala with full force with their rockets and their mountain guns. It's amazing that in 1868, they actually had rockets and guns of incredible power, which nobody in Africa had, had ever seen. Uh, anyway, as as they as Tawodrus defended himself at the gate to Magdala itself when all was lost, he shot himself um, with a with a pistol with a pistol that had been a gift from Victoria back in 1864, and it had this. Uh, it, it had this engraving on, on the back of it. Um, presented, it, this was engraved on the butt of the pistol. Presented by Victoria, Queen of Great Britain and Ireland to Theodore's Emperor of Abyssinia as a slight token of her gratitude for his kindness to our servant Plowden, 1864. Um, this is my photograph of the place where, he, at the gate to McDowell, where to ended his life. Um, before leaving to march back, four months on the road again with all of the freed hostages, the British burst out of Tawodrus's cannon and burned McDowell. And as for that mortar of Sevastopol, which was dragged to McDonald with such effort by Tarogras, it was never fired. Uh, Moorhead thought it had been fired because it had been uh, loaded with, uh, too, too, with too much power but it, and that it had burst, but it's obviously not burst. And I don't think they could maneuver it into position <coughs> in time to use it in the battle. So for all that work, it still lies there. And there was a, a fellow who was guarding it and we walked up to him and he said the Americans made it for two others, <laughs> which, uh, which we probably would have in this day and time. But anyway, um, this is me leaning on, on a stone which is thought to be the original uh, gravestone of two others. Uh, and here we are. With our adventure over, we gathered at the house of Michael Gray, the biologist, to say goodbye. And that's Michael on the left, Joanne with a dog in her lap, me with a pike, Schumann next to me, and Dr. Crummy with a cup of coffee. <laughs> One final shot, which I call mission accomplished. <laughs> this is the road sign, 435 miles from Gondo, where we started out. Now, I'd like to conclude by reading an assessment of Tarotas from Clement Markham's, who, in addition to being a well-known historian for his Arctic work, uh, wrote a wonderful history of the expedition. And this is what he said of uh, Tarotas. He was a genius and a very remarkable one. It's a misuse of terms to call him a savage, except in the sense that Peter the Great was a savage. They were both born kings of men, both endowed with military genius, both lovers of the mechanical arts, both possessed of dauntless courage, and while capable of noble and generous acts, both were frequently guilty of perpetrating the most horrible atrocities. Uh, and that concludes in, in the world.
questions I'm going to ask Schumann to answer. <laughs> Schumann is now is sitting here in the front row, is professor of history at Christopher U Newport University in Newport News. He came, he came to the States. He and Dr. Crummy both returned. Dr. Crummy became uh, head of the uh, African with the African Affairs Department, I did it, uh, Urbana-Champaign, and Schumann came over and got his PhD under Dr. Crummy. And unfortunately, although Dr. Crummy uh, vetted my manuscript, he died last August, and otherwise we would love to have had him here. Anyway, I'll take any questions I can try to answer. Yeah, I yeah, I'm just curious, uh, the traveling, uh, what was the, uh, the heat, uh, you know, when you were traveling daytime? It, the heat was, it, the, Ethiopia is one of the most wonderful climates on earth. You know, you're seven to 10,000 feet and it's just moderate and cool and it's, it's an incredibly beautiful and moderate place. So it was, it was great. It was cold at night. We often had sleep. When, it, when you had thunderstorms, you would get sweet, and sometimes the ground would look like it had snowed just from the accumulation of ice. But it, then, when the sun came out, it was warm. So it was a it was a wonderful place to travel, in, and still is. Yes. Uh, in such a dry area, what did you do for drinking water? We used Amazon pills, and they made you quite sick. Really. They made me quite sick. But uh, and we took in terraviraform for against mal uh, malaria, which we took a number of shots, but I, we, we didn't really have any, any health problems. And we avoided all those uh, bandits that were built so highly. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work out. Yeah. Did you ever return? I did. And nor did I write the movie script. <laughs> this book is written in expiation of that sin. You had a question back here. I was going to ask about okay. bandits, but they... You said they were, I was going to ask about all the bandits you were warned about, but they, they didn't materialize. Up. They stayed in. They stayed in the wings. Well, you know, Alpha Wasson was uh, Ali Selassie's son, and Don Crummy had actually gotten permissions from him. And then, the the way you crossed the countryside in those days is each governor would write on a slip of paper a permission, just a loose, just a piece of tablet paper, and you showed it. Otherwise, they wouldn't let you pass. <laughs> So that's how you cross the country. Now, Sherman, am I right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just going to ask about not so much purity of the drinking water on the top of that Magdala. When you're looking, you're way up high. Yeah. Where where's the water coming from? Were there springs up there? Where's there were springs. They were yes, they always had a water supply. It was <laughs> they had no problem with water and and these English the captives lived quite a good life up there. They, the Englishmen had gardens. They were in contact with the coast. They were able to get money. And they had three course meals. And the only problem they had is they didn't know whether they would live or die. You know, <laughs> the soldiers arrived. But while they were waiting, they made, it up. they made puddings. They raised tomatoes and vegetables. They fed the birds. They did what Englishmen do. <laughs> And by rights, they could have all been wiped out. But uh, I think one of the most interesting aspects of this is how many of these prisoners were men and what were women and children, and how few were Englishmen. They were, by my count, there were only five Englishmen, and, and the parliament voted the equivalent of five billion dollars to spring them. And they took the other guys out with them. But uh, it's an incredible hostage situation. That it, I mean, the fact that it's 400 miles, you know, four months to get there. And if Tawodras had had his original army, they would have been intercepted in that wild country and they would never have gotten there. But, but as it was, there were, there were chiefs who were rebelling against him and, and the British made, made good use of them and they were allowed free passage the whole way, which facilitated the expedition. There's a huge, there are two huge volumes, this big, uh, the official, by the War Department, the official history of the expedition, in which they list every donkey and every mule and every saddle. And they, they had the Indian army and they actually had to feed several different types of Indians. You know, they had 
different Indians who ate different menus, and the English planned it all, and everybody got <coughs> what he was used to. Yes. I'm not so sure I want to take on those three volumes, but was there a book that condensed this history, uh, this particular expedition? Well, not my expedition, but the no, British sure, but no, no, just, just, just read, it's the last section of Alan Moorhead's The Blue Nile, called The British in Ethiopia, and it's about 40 pages. And he does a great job of it. I, where I differ with him is, he, he, he took, he, he was very se severe critic of Tolovus and said he was a megalomaniac and emphasized the cruel things he did, which he did do. But he had enormous hope to begin with and to come up from, as he said, raised from the dust and the, the place where he came from, I think he, he, he was a remark, it's a, it's a true tragedy. What was the name of the book again? He also wrote The White Nile, which is another marvelous. At the time, at, at the time of this expedition, they had just discovered the source of the of the, of the Nile. You know, it was, and, and Moorhead did a great job of describing all of the adventures. Who, uh, yes. What happened after Wolves died? Was there a power vacuum or? There was there was there was a power vacuum, and uh, and uh, one of the one of the men who had aided the British became the king. Uh, Truman, help me on that. Yeah, this was uh, Johannes the fourth. So one of the United States <coughs> that had been fighting with Columbus yeah. eventually ended up in uh, defeating the other opposition and becoming king. <coughs> he was the first guest king. Um, in the Metropolitan Museum last summer, there was an exhibition of Julia Margaret Cameron photographs, and one of the photographs was of Tawadros' son, yes. who went to England. Do you want to tell that story? Yeah, his, his son was just a boy when, when his father was killed, and the, and the British took him back to England, and Victoria took a special interest in him, and they made a little Englishman out of him. They, they, they see, he, you see photographs of him, and tweed suits and things, but he died at the age of 19. A lot of people think of a broken heart. He was ripped out of Ethiopia and uh, put in a world that, you know, had no meaning to him. And, uh, it's a very sad story. Am I right, Sean? Yes. 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 John, thank you for your fascinating narrative. Can you tell us a little bit about the countryside today? I can't, but I'll ask Sherman to tell you. It's, it's probably much more crowded now than, than, than <laughs> 1972. Uh, the, the land had degraded significantly. Uh, I've seen part of it two years ago, and uh, it's really a very different uh, landscape that you see. The, what, what you have to remember is Ethiopia, after we left, Three years after we left, Ali Selassie was deposed and he was murdered by Mengistu Mariam, a dictator who was responsible for killing people in prodigious ways that Tawodras couldn't imagine. And probably over a million people were, were killed, including a lot of the students, and that's why Shulit became a guerrilla against Mengistu. All the students originally were basically Marxist and they wanted to, they thought that Ali Selassie was, you know, he was outmoded and he wasn't giving people a chance and they wanted a revolution. But when they got the revolution, this major Mengistu turned out to be a horrible man. And, and he soon went after the students. So, and the other thing that happened uh, was there were two famines, two severe famines in what, 72 and 70, and 85, and 85 which, which killed, you, everybody remembers seeing that in the news, there were thousands of people died. And then you had this, uh, this uh, dictatorship take over, and he, he was, uh, he was, I mean, this dude now lives in Rhodesia, uh, <laughs> courtesy of Mr. McGovery, who took him in with all the money he stole from Ethiopia, and uh, this Mengistu was deposed in, in 1991, am I right? Yeah. 1991. Yeah, 1991. And I'm not an expert on the political history since then. It's, it's very complicated. Maybe one yes. more question? Why did Victoria choose Napier? 
And what happened to him after here? He, well, he was General Napier, and he became Lord Napier, and his statue was in London, you've probably seen it. <laughs> he became a great man. He was head of the Indian Army, and they selected him. Uh, this, it's amazing that when Cameron was put in chains for not, you know, because Victoria hadn't answered this letter, the British made an attempt to, they, they finally sent an answer in, but they sent it in by an Iraqi, uh, an English citizen, an Iraqi named Rassam, who spoke Arabic. Glovis also spoke Arabic, and they, they sent him in to try to, you know, give a reply, and, but by then, Glovis's empire was declining on its own, and he decided to make Rassam and his, and his group, they became the English, they were basically Cameron first, and then the group who came to rescue him were the only Englishmen who, who were hostages. So for those five or six guys, this enormous army went in. And it's really amazing because it, I could say the odds were that Trogus would have killed the, the hostages and they would have done it all for nothing, but, but he let them go. Yes, Mark. John, did the English expedition take anything else back with them besides the hostages? They, yeah, they did. The uh, top MacDonald was the royal treasury. and. To orders had brought all of the stuff accumulated from all the kings, and enormous amounts of gold and crosses, and and the British took it all. Wow, it's in the British Museum, and they also had an auction right afterwards, and they divided up the proceeds. The people from the museum were on the were on the expedition, and they paid so much for each one of these things, and then they whacked up whatever the proceeds were among the soldiers. Hmm. And then they marched out. It's a strange situation. Given this horrendous history with Great Britain, why did Holly Selassie uh, seek refuge in London during the war? During in, in World London? War? He lived in Putney. Yeah. Well, I don't know how to answer that, except I don't think uh, I don't, I don't think this reverberated that much with him. He spoke English, he also spoke French. You know, when he made that famous speech to the League of Nations, he did it in Amharic, but they said that he could have done it equally fluently in English or French, but he didn't. He did, he, it's one of the great speeches of all time. He said, if you hear you're standing aside while Italy, our country, takes our country and he said, why won't you do something about it? You may be next, in essence. And they didn't, they voted basically to do nothing. He lived in England because England sent the Enterprise, some folks, to pick him up in Djibouti, yeah. and to take him through the thing, through Gibraltar, and up to yeah. London, and put him in that where he bought a house. This lady has written a, a book about this herself, so she's a good book about it. I, I don't know that much about Alice Selassie, except I think uh, he, he is viewed more favorably now than he was when, when he was overthrown because it, I, I think changing a, a society like Ethiopia from a feudal society the way it was to a modern society, it just it, it's, it involves a lot of uprooting. Um, Jumit could, can attest to that. You, you come from the countryside and suddenly you now you, you can't go back. You can't go back where you came from. Uh, Schumann's story is, I think, quite moving. His father saw students and, and said, I, I, want to, I want to send one of my children to school. And he said, I'll send my firstborn. And that's the only one he could afford to. So Schumann's brothers and sisters would always remain peasants. And yet uh, Schumann now has a PhD and, you know, and is a, a scholar. But he, you, he, you can't go back and file anymore. You just you can't go backwards in a in a in a society, and, and it it made for a lot of a, a lot of problems. A lot of the students got to Addis, and there were no work for them. So they were educated, and they couldn't go back. But they couldn't do anything civilized either. They couldn't they couldn't be farmers or bureaucrats. There was nothing. But now I'm not the first to talk about this, but I think that's just. <coughs> Hello, um, I'm just happy and honored 
Thank you so much, right? It's so beautiful in the photographs. Your, your nature, your passion, your respect for the culture. This is unbelievable. So I thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>